My name is Jack Stewart. I'm an AMP IA. Uh, I also instruct part-time at an AMP school in Springfield, Illinois. It's part of Lincoln Land Community College, but it is a, a certified Part 147 school. I've been working on engines all my life. I think I put my first engine together when I was about 14, and it actually ran. I worked on drag racers. Uh, a cousin of mine and I, I had a car back in the late 60s, early 70s. We won the AHRA Pro Championship three years in a row until we ran out of some money, but anyway. <laughs> uh, I've, I've had a lot of fun, and I have a lot of fun at school teaching young people about my specialty is engines, obviously. And uh, I, wanna, I wanna cover a couple of things that Randy was talking about. It's always amazed me that little flyery held up thing is part of part 43 out of the FARs. It covers everything that mechanics can do owner operators can do. And it's always amazed me, the very first part like he read, essentially the FAA says that if it takes any more than a hammer and a screwdriver, you shouldn't be messing with it as an owner operator. And then they turn around and say, okay, as an owner, you can take your spark plugs out, clean them, gap them, and put them back in. Well, how many guys have a calibrated torque wrench? And you're not supposed to use anything on an airplane except calibrated tools, tools that can be calibrated. And I've asked other people that, well, I just go see my IA and borrow his. Okay, that's fine. I've got a $600 snap on torque wrench. I don't just let anybody walk out the door with it. And if you don't properly torque the spark plugs, I've seen them blown out the cow, blow one right out of the cylinder. Well, it tears the cylinder up, and maybe more parts on the airplane. That's just one item. Anyway, like Randy said, use all the knowledge that you can get a hold of. If you want to change your own spark plugs, that's fine. If you don't know how to do it, go get your friendly mechanic to show you how to do it properly. I'll tell you some more about that after a while. Now, he said something about he don't make every little thing, every little entry in a logbook. I keep a notepad beside my logbook because if I run into a screw and it's loose, maybe not just a screw, but especially bolts on an engine. Randy had three bolts on his engine that were leaking oil. I knew I torqued them when I put the engine together, but they were loose and leaking oil. I snugged them up, he flew home, and he said, guess what? Those same three bolts are loose again. Well, that was just a period of about an hour. But if you run into a situation where, I tightened that bolt up, didn't I? If you make an entry in a little, it don't have to be in the logbook, but make an entry on a notepad. I tightened up such and such a bolt on this day. Because a couple of months down the road, if that same bolt's loose, you may have a, an underlying problem somewhere that needs to be addressed. In his case, I think the threads are wore out in the case because I had him clean the holes out, get rid of all the oil, and use some Loctite on them, put the bolts back in. Whether that's a legal repair or not, I'm not gonna get into that. But anyway, it worked. It hasn't leaked since. And uh, the rules also say that we're not supposed to do anything to an airplane unless we have the maintenance manual for it. These old airplanes, the maintenance manual are not much, about that thick, compared to Piper and Cessna that's that thick. But folks, if you want to work on your own airplane, I'm all for you. Get the maintenance manuals. Do it right. Do it like the book says. A few years ago in Oshkosh, and I'm not going to mention any names except mine and, and Larry Wheelock, I was helping Larry 
with his presentation. <clears throat> and there was a guy sitting in the front row that overhauls cylinders. We'll put it like that. And he had been doing it wrong. The cylinders that was on Randy's plane, the reason we had to replace most of them is because they were done wrong and they cracked. So anyway, this guy was sitting there taking notes when I started in about how to do those cylinders. And all I was doing was quoting the maintenance manual. You have to heat them up to 600 degrees, pull the sleeves, pull the valve guides, put them back in, put them back in an oven. Some people refer to that as heat treating. It's not, it's called normalizing. Put them back in an oven, let them bake for another couple of hours. They normalize. All these parts fit together, all the molecules. I mean, if you want to get into the chemistry of it. And then you shut the oven off and walk away and let it cool down overnight. That's the only way to do these cylinders because they're not like Lycomings or Continentals. And uh, Randy said, learn all you can. Uh, I've learned a lot in my life, but <laughs> I can't remember it. <laughs> so anyway, I'll talk about Franklin engines. And I'm not, I'm not smarter than anybody here. In fact, most of you people are probably smarter than I am. I've just got a little bit more experience in this area. The Franklin Engine Company started out <clears throat> around 1902, I think it was, uh, but they were really at their heyday in the 1920s building cars. This is an early Franklin car. It's got an air-cooled engine in it. <laughs> Look at the frame rails. Looks like something out of an old barn. But they built air-cooled engines for motor cars. They built the whole car. Nice cars. Looks like a Duesenberg in the background. But you can see the big fan here in the front. The cylinders all had fins on them, and it sucked air in and over the cylinders. The Franklin Engine Company. Yeah, no radiator, didn't need one. We think it's kind of a crazy looking car today, but I'm sure in the day it was very stylish. They were upscale cars. It wasn't, it wasn't a Model T buyer's car. It was stuff that upper crust people bought. Pretty nice stuff. Well, then the 20s and 30s come along, the Great Depression, and Franklin Engine Company went belly up, so to speak. A bunch of the people that worked there got together. And John, if I'm wrong on any of this history stuff, correct me. <clears throat> I don't always get my facts right. But anyway, some of the employees got together and bought the Franklin Engine Company, renamed it Air Cool Motors. Well, all the tooling still said Franklin on it, so they kept on making Franklin parts. People refer to them as Franklin. But if you look at the data plate on your engines, you'll see they were manufactured by the air cool motors. Well, then a guy named Tucker, he came along and they even made a movie about him. He was quite the entrepreneur. <clears throat> BS, or I call him, but anyway, he was pretty good at it. And he had this idea for these cars. He wanted a rear engine car that was so modern and ahead of its time that it would just blow anything that Ford or Chevy or the big three were building. And he done it. The only problem is he sold cars he didn't have. Here, I'm gonna sell you a car. Uh, by the way, you need to give me $4,000 down payment so I can go, got the money to go build this car. Well, it worked pretty good for a while until the Stock Exchange Commission got on him about it. And uh, anyway, he went bankrupt. Well, he owned the Air Cool Motors, and when he went bankrupt, they went bankrupt. About 1950 That's when they finally resolved everything, I think it was. <clears throat> so they only built 51 of them, and I think there's only 49 that's been accounted for. So if you find one of these babies in the barn, you can just add a whole bunch of zeros to whatever it's worth. Uh, 
they were really modern as you can see the interior was kind of aircraft themed there was no dash over here of course nobody thought about wearing seat belts back then the big thing i remember when i was a kid in the 50s a car wreck you was always hearing about somebody went through the windshield i remember a big thing go up look at the wrecked cars and the windshield was all busted out well he took away all the stuff for the passenger to hit the driver can hold on to the steering wheel but the passenger you're on your own and uh, anyway go on to the engines oh that's my plane on your left and this dash three over here is a plane that I got a few hours in and got bit by the Stenson bug and this gentleman here is named Dennis he signed me off he gave me my tailwheel endorsement he's an excellent pilot CFI helicopter CFI all kinds of stuff but this was a fly-in we had a few years ago and we pulled our planes up to fuel them up and somebody took a picture and said, hey, that's a pretty good looking picture. So I even let Susan Prowl have it if she wants to uh, use it. <clears throat> One of the biggest things about Franklin engines compared to Continentals and Lycomings is the Franklin cylinder is cast all one piece of aluminum and then they put a steel sleeve inside of them. Where Lycoming and Continental, this part's aluminum, the head, and the steel sleeve is a piece of steel, and it's actually screwed into the head. Uh, that looks like a 320 cylinder. This is an 0200 Continental cylinder. Compared to these, Franklin was so far ahead of everybody else, it wasn't funny. But there's some things you need to be aware of on your Franklin engines. The top of them, the machine smooth, where this is a all cast, whole bunch of crap. Our rocker arms are bolted on. They set up nice, and uh, we can adjust our valves. The rest of them don't do that. The bottom of the cylinder, sorry, that's not a very good picture. I took these over at school. I had, uh, I don't remember if that was one of, might have been one of your cylinders, Randy, when I took it over to school. Now, you go look at your engines, and you see this little Allen screw down at the base of the engine. In fact, Larry was talking about last night, didn't you say yours was leaking around one of these screws? Is that what you said? Or is this leaking around the cylinder? Okay. Don't touch them. Don't mess with those things. If it appears to be loose, get some Loctite 290, which is a wicking Loctite. Maybe take a little toothbrush or something, or I use a lot, I use breaking parts cleaner a lot. It, it'll dissolve the grease and oil and just evaporates away almost immediately. Spray a little of that in there to clean it up and use some of that wicking Loctite. It's 290. It will wick right into the threads and keep that thing tight. Because the reason you don't want to mess with that is there's a steel pin that goes into the sleeve when they put them together. They drill a hole all the way through the sleeve after they put them in there. This is a steel sleeve sticking out. And there's a speck on how far that sticks out. It's 500,000, half an inch. They heat the cylinder up to 600 degrees, pull the old sleeve out, shove the new one in it, and like I said, put it back in an oven and it normalizes. Well, then they drill a hole and they put a steel pin in there and they screw that Allen, in, uh, Allen screw in behind it. If you try to tighten that up, what you're gonna do is you're gonna push that steel pin on in that sleeve some more. Your piston's gonna come down and hit it. And I, hadn't, I, I know this for a fact because a guy had it happen. Oh, I seen that thing was loose and I tightened it up and then I started my engine up and it started making a noise. Well, yeah, I took the bottom off the piston. So don't mess with those screws. And if they're leaking, don't get your mechanic, just do it yourself. Shh. Allen set screw, right. And there it is on the inside of the sleeve. Of course, they put that in there and then they machine the sleeve to size. And of course, this one's been honed. 
Yeah, that is one of your cylinders because I honed it after I cleaned it all up. There it is. Do what? It's kind of tapered, not much, but it's got a little taper on it. But you can push it on in there. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. Eddie already knows he's over all more of these cylinders than most people. But uh, anyway, yeah, if you go tighten it up on that screw, you're going to push that in there. You can see what happened to your piston skirt when it comes down and hits that pin. Spark plugs. I've had two or three people ask me yesterday, last night, today, well, I got these spark plugs. They're supposed to be good for a Stenson. Uh, I don't know. There are several plugs that will fit in our Franklin engines, but this is the only one I recommend. They last a long time, for one thing. You can see they look like an old car plug, because they were. They're a shielded type car plug. If you use What's one of them? AC44 or something like that. I've got a box full of them at home. They're a massive electrode plug that looks just like any other airplane plug, but the clearance on them is only about 10 thousandths. And you put them in your engine, and they'll run fine for 10 or 15 hours, and then they're done. And there's a, there's a couple more. But anyway, yeah, they're pricey. Uh, expect four or five hundred hours if you keep them clean, keep them gapped, and run mo gas. Spark plugs hate lead. Remember the old cars, if you guys are old enough, back in the day, we would change oil, plugs, points, and condenser. That was a standard thing about every 2,500, 5,000 miles, whatever it was. Maybe every other oil change, you was changing plugs and points of condenser. They wasn't wearing out. They was getting lead fouled, or the lead going by them was eating them up. That's what happened to those plugs. And these electrodes here, because this is the ground and the, the electricity shoots from here to here, these will erode eventually. And I've seen them broke off and still running. It's amazing. But... Uh, Randy had a deal set up on eBay. I think we're both pretty well set for spark plugs now. Uh, he put them in watch and shoot. We got some of them for, what, eight or ten bucks a piece, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just, just set up an alert on eBay for REJ38. Yeah. So, you can see the difference here. This is our Franklin plug. Nice looking plug. This is a, a Champion REM40, which is a standard plug like out of a Lycoming. This is a massive electrode plug. This one happens to be wore out. I, because I teach the kids, Champion says if this gets oval and worn 50%, the plug's no good anymore. Usually they'll quit firing before they are aware of that. Part. These things, like I said, I've seen this electrode broke off and the fire is still jumping from here to, to this ground part. It's amazing. Of course, you know, a magneto is putting out about 40,000 volts, so it ought, to, it ought to jump over there pretty good. Intake manifolds. If you read the manual, they tell you exactly how to torque the cylinders on a Franklin engine. This is a part of confusion. This is a Continental 0300 intake manifold. And you'll see it's in three pieces with rubbers here. So you can bolt those cylinders on, torque them down, put the intake manifold on, torque it down, and the rubber makes up for anything. But on a Franklin engine, woo, ain't that a pretty one. It's all one piece cast. And the book will tell you, Put the cylinders on loose. Now, if you ever have an occasion to pull one cylinder off or replace your intake gaskets, which happens sometimes, put the cylinders on loose. 
bolt this on and torque it down without the gaskets. Then go back and torque your cylinders down. Take this back off, put the gaskets on and torque it back up. Yeah, it's an extra step, but like I say, these engines were built with a whole lot more precision than what Lycoming and Continental build their stuff. These, these babies were so far ahead of their time. Uh, and you can see, this one's been set up with fuel injection. I think this is, oh, I think this is one of those PZL engines that they talk about selling, but nobody's ever seen one running. Basically, it's the same engine that we got in our airplanes, except this is different. And somebody was talking about moisture condensing in their engine, I think last night, some discussion I was listening to. Well, on Lycomings, you go out and fly, shove it in your hangar, or Continentals, the high point of the engine is where the moisture is gonna condense. Well, where's the high point in the Lycoming? Magnetos. I pull a mag off a Lycoming and I see rust in it. The camshaft's also up here in the Lycoming. Oh, you. Pull the mag off and you see rust in the mag, chances are your camshaft's rusty too. And you can imagine rust is a grit and you start rubbing grit together, what happens? It don't take long and it'll eat the camshaft and or lifters up. So anyway, Franklin, this is the end of the starter here. The starter goes in here like an old flathead Ford. Here's a vent. This is a high point in a Franklin engine. So any moisture condenses in the engine, comes up here to this vent, goes on out. Uh, any Bonanza drivers in here? You ever have a Bonanza? D did you get in the habit of when you put it in the hangar, you unscrewed the oil spiller? Oh, filler spiller, yeah. The oil filler spout. <laughs> a lot of guys do on those big Continentals. It gives that moisture that's condensed in the engine a place to go. It's this, I don't know, I, I've always heard it called the old Bonanza driver's trick. But anyway, wow, $35,000, cheap. Yeah, Randy said we overhaul his engine last year. He brought it over for an annual. <clears throat> One cylinder was a little low on compression. Well, because we can adjust our valves, the other guys can't, and they're very specific about where you adjust those valves, it's 40 thousandths. Lycoming gives you a range of 40 to 80 or something like that. But anyway, we adjust our valves at 40 thousandths. So this one cylinder was a little low on compression and I thought maybe a valve's tightened up on it a little bit. If the face of the valve wears, the valve's gonna come up in the seat a little more and it's gonna tighten up. So I thought, I'll pull it off and check the valve clearance because it's been a while since I've been in there uh, in those springs, that's another story. And I pulled this rocker cover down and I said, oh God, what have we here? Probably if he'd had the remote oil filter on that he's got now, it may not have been an issue. But seeing that much metal, I mean, I could stick my finger in the corners and my finger would come out silver, fine metal. So I called Chris Collum. If you guys are not familiar with him, you need to get familiar with him. He's, he owns a shop down in Bruton, Alabama, and he is the go-to guy for Franklin engine stuff. He knows his stuff. And I called him and I said, what do you think, Chris? And he said, sounds like you're losing a cam or lifters with that fine metal, and I said, it's called Airworks if you want to write that down, A-I-R-W-O-R-X. Uh, he said, sounds like a cam, and I said, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. In any event, the engine's gonna to have to be tore down because we don't know how much more metal's down in the engine, and you know what that's gonna to do to the bearings. So anyway, we tore it down, we overhauled it. What else we got on this? Oh yeah, when I started taking the engine apart, what we got here? Red RTV. <clears throat> if a guy don't really know what he's doing when he puts the exhaust gaskets up 
and they fall back off a couple of times. Oh, I'll fix that baby and squirt a bunch of red RTV around it and stick it up there. No, no. In fact, Continental come out with a service bullet in 1974. Don't use any silicone sealers around our engines at all. I pulled a cylinder off an 0300 here a while back and it had red silicone all around the cylinder. And the guy standing there said, well, that's the way we done it back in the day. And I said, you said this engine only had 600 hours on it. I got that service bullet and I showed him. I said, this is from 1974. Franklin don't have such a service bullet, but don't use that crap if you can help it. Because I walked in a shop one day and this guy was putting a, a cover plate on a, it was a 470 Continental. Anyway, that don't make any difference. And he had red RTV squeezed out around that thing this far. That baby won't leak no more. And I said, uh, so and so, I said, you think if you got it squeezed out this far on the outside, don't you think it's that far on the inside? And can you imagine a chunk of this stuff getting in an oil passage somewhere? The engine ran exactly 60 hours before it toasted the crank. Oh, well, don't use that crap, guys. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been in an aircraft engine or not, but this is a Franklin right-hand case. <clears throat> Randy's. We use his for a lot of stuff, don't we? Uh, they're a little bit different in some respects. On Lycomings and Continentals, we use aircraft sealer and silk thread. That's what they recommend. And I have my students put it on. I tell them, smear it on so thin you can read a paper through it. Because what it's for mainly is to hold the thread. So you smear it on all the case the parts of the case that meet, and then you bolt the cases together. Well, this is a little earlier. In fact, this is a 150. And Franklin used, it was like a piece of rubber O-ring in these grooves right here. Well, yeah, it's a pain in the butt to put it in. It's a pain in the butt to keep it in there till you get the cases slapped together. But here again, these are more precision engines. They're a pain in the butt, but God, I love them. <laughs> this is a little bit better picture of those grooves. And when we call Susan, and if you don't know Susan by now, you better get to know her too. Susan Prowl, Franklin Engine Company in Jewett, Texas. And I said, I need an overhaul gasket set for a 150. Okay, what else you need? Well, all the stuff to overhaul a 150, and we'll hope the crank's good, and it turned out that ours was. Uh, it polished up. 20 under on the mains and 10 under on the rods, wasn't it? Because we got all 20 under, and they wouldn't fit on the rods. We had to send them back. Anyway, there's the grooves. Yeah. My uh, little helper over in the office at school helped me put this thing together. To me, one of the best flying airplanes I've ever sat in. They beat spam cans. They fly a whole lot smoother than a 170 Cessna. The 170 Cessna was built to compete with this. They're both considered, oh, I got in a big discussion on the internet about this. You know how things are on the internet. I'd say they're basically a 100 mile an hour airplane. Oh man, these guys jumped on. Well, mine goes 120. No, it don't. Yeah, it does all the time. No, it don't. Do the math. If you have a prop that meets the type certificate data sheet and you've got the original Franklin engine in it, if you've got a 52 pitch prop and you're turning it at 2600 RPM, you're going to go through the air 52 inches every revolution. Unless you're overspeeding the motor, or you've got a different prop on, 
or you've got a heck of a tailwind. Shoot, I've seen 120 on mine coming down here. But I had about a 12, 14 knot tailwind too. And I didn't mean to say, of course they took it literally on the internet and all these guys jumped on me. Every Stinson is a 100 mile an hour Stinson. No, Jody's probably does a little better than that. It don't meet the type certificate data sheet, that's why. Uh, Bob Steelhammer, I think he come on and he chimed in, well mine goes, yeah, it's got a Lycoming in it. It's not as smooth as mine. No, there's nothing wrong with that. It's good. I'm, I'm glad that somebody cooked up the STC so we have options because, face it, the last parts for a Franklin engine were built 1948, 49, and Tucker shut down the aircraft engine part of it and concentrated on the cars. It's hard to believe that right after World War II, 65% of all small aircraft engine orders was for Franklins. Bonanzas originally had Franklins in them. Balancas, uh, uh, God name it, Bell 47 helicopters, 172 Cessnas. They all used Franklins at one time. They've all since been replaced because we can't get the parts anymore. We can get them, but you have to scrounge around for them. Uh, Eddie's talking about coming up with a couple of cranks for 10 bucks a piece or something like that. Lucky devil. If I find something like that, you bet I'm gonna jump on it. If, even if they haven't been magna fluxed. Cranks are hard to find. Pistons are hard to find. All the rest of the parts are pretty much available. Uh, I had an exhaust valve go out of mine <sighs> two or three years ago, whenever it was, and I called Susan and she said, you're in luck. Somebody in Colorado died or went out of business or something. She got a whole truckload of new old stock exhaust valves. 150 bucks. But hey, you ain't working on a Ford or Chevy. Let's keep these old girls flying. Thank you. <clears throat> What's that? PTL. PTO. Whatever. What's PTO? Is that a terrorist organization? PTL. The Polish company. Bachman Turner Overdrive? No, I'm sorry. You got any questions, folks? <clears throat> Anybody but you? No. <laughs> Okay, the 150s, the 150 is hardly any different than a 165. What they did to get that extra 15 horsepower is they changed the cam profile. So the rocker arms go up and down farther. Okay, they found out real quick, the rocker arms gonna hit the valve covers on 150s. They're both 335 cubic inch engines. They both use the same internal parts, except for the camshaft and the lifters are a little different and the timing's different. Uh, 150 engine times at 28 degrees before top dead center, and a 165 times at 32. That gives it that extra 15 horsepower. So, when does an aircraft engine make rated horsepower? Does anybody know the answer to that? This is an answer I stump my students with all the time. Full power, climb out, taking off, the rest of the time, you pull it back, it don't make 165 horsepower anymore. In fact, uh, we just went to an engine shop up by uh, Griffith, Indiana, up by Chicago. I take the guys up there, kids, some of them are women. And he had a, I think it was a 360 Lycoming on the, after they build an engine, they put them on a run-up stand for about four hours. And it's amazing to look at the, they chart this engine when they change the RPM on it. And when it's sitting there idling, and we're talking about a 200 horsepower engine, 200 horsepower rated, IO360. How much horsepower do you think an IO360 makes it idle? Your lawnmower makes more, in, more horsepower. 
makes six horsepower at idle. And you gotta get it on up. Uh, I was really surprised at the horsepower curve on it. Uh, even at about half throttle, it was only making about 115 horse. I thought, wow, you know, half throttle, you'd think it'd make 150. It'd make half the rated horsepower. No, when you get up close to where, like takeoff speed, uh, 20, 2450 in Lycoming, when you get up that high, then it's making the rated horsepower. But man, you start backing the throttle down and it comes down pretty quick. And uh, anyway, that's where most of us want to fly. You don't want to, you don't want to be right on, you don't want to be wide open. Number one, there's a circuit in the carburetor called the economizer circuit. How in the heck it ever got named the economizer circuit, I don't know because what it's doing is shoving extra gas in there. So if you pull the throttle back just a little bit, you're getting out of the economizer circuit, you're gonna save a little gas. And I normally fly 2630, 2640, but I got a 165. So a 150, you wanna fly about 100 RPM lower. Now, where do you normally fly? About 25, 2550. Okay, so a 150. And he can just about keep up with me. In fact, Yesterday when we left Eureka and flew down here, I was pulling my throttle, I was following him and I was pulling my throttle back and finally when I got him where we was just about staying even, I looked down and I was turning 2550. But uh, anyway, that's why there's dimples in the, in the valve covers. So the dimples are the 165? Dimples in the 165. They'll fit on a 150, no problem. The cylinders are basically the same. Usually a 150's got two of those Allen screws in it where a 165's only got one. And sometimes you'll run into some that's spark plug set at a different angle. And a lot of times, I think his has got two cylinders on it that's got a spark plug set at the angle. On the right hand side, they're pointing to the front. On the left hand side, they point to the back. Sometimes they put an extra plug, they'll have an extra spark plug hole, and they'll plug those so they can use them on either side and point the spark plugs wherever they want. But uh, I haven't seen too many of those cylinders anymore. They're probably getting all used up. Remember guys, they haven't built these parts since 48, 49, so we're dealing with 70 year old metal and it's bound to give up. I don't care if you got new parts off the, off the shelf, it's still 70 year old metal. Of course it hasn't been ran and used, but uh, it's 70 year old metal, things break. Jack, I, again, what RPM do you recommend cruising at? I'm sorry. What, what Brett, RPM do you recommend cruising at? I usually, I usually cruise 2600 or above. Sometimes I'll go down to, in the 2500s, but hey, What's the old saying? Running like you stole it? You're not going to, if you turn 2650 in a 165 and you go down to 2550, you're not going to save that much gas. God, guys, gas is cheap compared to a $25,000 overhaul. Oil is cheap compared to a $25,000 overhaul. Change your oil. I use this, this is a personal thing. I use 1550 Aero Shell. Some of the gold timers will preach, oh, you gotta run a straight weight in them. No, you don't. I mean, yeah, back in the 70s, I was one of those hard-headed guys that says, there's no way you can make oil flow like 15 when it's cold and 50 when it's hot. Well, got my mind changed on that when we, when we start overhauling our, our race car engines and finding out that, hey, for one thing, multi-viscosity oils is part synthetic, most of them. And synthetic type oil is a lot slicker than petroleum oil. Okay, it's keeping your parts lubricated better. There's also some additives. I'm, I'm sure all the oils have it. Uh, bought a Navy on. Me and another guy bought a Navy on, set in the corner hanger for 15 years, 14 years. And it's got a 435 Lycoming in it. 
It's got a dipstick on it, kind of like a Continental, you could screw it out. So I took my bore scope and I shoved down. I bore scoped the cylinders. Well, they're chrome cylinders. There's not going to be any rust in there. And I turned around and looked at the valves and there was a little bit of white corrosion in the heads, but not bad for setting for 15 years, 14 years. So I managed to get my bore scope down in that oil filler hole so I could look at the cam. I was really concerned about the cam. You could still see oil varnish on the cam. The cam was not pitted a bit. And I told my partner, I said, I think this would be a pretty good buy. And it took a while to get her running, but I had to do some more work to it. But we got her running, runs like a champ, carries 85 pounds of oil pressure. Yeah. So these newer oils, the TBO on a Franklin engine used to be 800 hours. Then they bumped it up to <clears throat> 1,200 hours. Now I would not be afraid to run it till it breaks. With the new oils we've got, they lubricate a lot better. Uh, they keep the engine a whole lot cleaner inside than that old, that old crap did. Those old straight weight non-detergent oils. God, what was I thinking? But anyway, I, I tear engines down all the time, and they're just as clean inside as the top of that table. Might have 2,000 hours on them. As long as the compressions are good. And on a Franklin, when you start talking about compressions, everybody knows how compression works, right? Hook up your gauges, and you introduce 80 pounds of air into the cylinder. It's actually a leak down test. It's not really a compression test. You're checking to see how much air goes by the rings and by the valves. So if you hear air hissing out of the exhaust, I don't care if you've got 60 or 70 pounds of compression. You better be finding out why the air is coming out the exhaust. Either the valve's not seated or the valve's bad or something. So anyway, as long as the compressions are good, even in your Lycoming, as long as it's not using an overly amount of oil, Usually it's leaking it out instead of using it. That's common too. And as long as hopefully you've got an oil filter on that you can cut open every time you change oil and look for metal particles. And the way I do that is I like to go out in the bright sunlight and I, I, got, a, I got a table at home that, that it's oil soaked. And I'll cut the oil filter open and I'll pull the paper out and I'll stretch it out on a table. And I got the sun shining on it, and I'm looking for glittery stuff like you saw in that valve cover. If I don't see any glittery stuff, I'll take a magnet and run over it. Well, just like I tell the students in school, you have to know what the pieces inside the engine are made out of to know what you're looking for. If you're finding aluminum, chances are you're losing a piston or something's going on to the case. That's the aluminum pieces in there. If you run a magnet over it and you find steel, usually you look for camshaft or lifters first. And it's easy in a Franklin. Pull that top cover off and you can look right down in there and see the cam. If the crank's in the way, run you a bore scope in there. Shoot, you can buy a bore scope now at Harbor Freight for $49.95 or something like that. It works just as good as that three or $400 snap-on does. I know I got one. In fact, I got two. The first one I bought wouldn't go down in a 14 millimeter spark plug hole. Guys, what's your thoughts on analysis? Do you use it? Do you recommend it? A oil change? Would that be something that would if be no more than we fly, I don't really recommend an oil analysis unless, now like Randy's got a newly overhauled engine. If he wanted to get set up on a program, but if you just take one oil sample and send it in, they can't tell much about it. They need to, you need to be on a program where you've got a scale to compare stuff to. Oh, one more thing about spark plugs and my story about Larry. You guys, y'all hungry? You want to go eat or you want to listen to me jabber? We were standing at Watertown, Wisconsin. I got there a little early. 
and the other guys were coming in. And, of course, every time you hear an airplane, look up. If you don't, you ain't got no business messing with them. Right? So I heard one coming. Hey, I know that plane. Oh, it sounds like crap. What's the matter with that thing? And he taxied up. This is a full-service Cirrus. They've got 11 or 12 mechanics, most of them young guys. And he taxis up, and Pam jumps out, his wife, slams the door, and she said, I'll never get in that damn thing again. And Larry come over, and I said, what's up, buddy? Of course, I'd met him a few years before at Oshkosh. Well, he said, about 50 miles out, it started running kind of bad. Ooh. I'm going to let these mechanics look at it. Okay. So we're all standing around, and a great guy named uh, Gil Wilcox, he's standing there. Gil's a character, too. And this young mechanic's up on a ladder, starts to screw the spark plug out of number six. I'm sorry. Number five. First front cylinder on the left side. Easiest spark plug to get to. And he gives it about a half a turn and it just falls out. And he said, uh, I think I found your problem. And he shows us the plug and there's no threads on the plug because the threads out of the head is on the plug. So it's smooth. And I said, yeah, that's interesting. Larry said, wow, what are we going to do? And this kid starts talking about, well, uh, we're going to have to put your plane in a hangar. We're going to have to order a cylinder and and uh, it's going to be three or four months or whatever. <clears throat> no, you don't have to do that. Huh? I said, you don't have to do that. I said, put a cup in it. Slang term. And I couldn't think what the technical name was. And I'm standing there. He said, what? I said, a cup. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a threaded bushing looking thing. Doggone it, I use them all the time. Oh, I've never heard of that. Well, Gil's standing there, and he's on the phone, hands me the phone. It's Dave James in Wayne, Michigan. And he said, it's called Save a Thread, Jack. And I said, yeah, Save a Thread, that's what you want. I said, is there a Napa store around here? About three blocks down the street. So the three of us hop in a courtesy car, and we go down to the Napa store, walk in, and there's this big biker-looking dude behind the counter. And he said, what do you need, guys? And I said, I need a save a thread for a 14 millimeter spark plug. Like he sells them every five minutes, man. He just, there you go. And I told Larry, I said, well, it's about 50 bucks for the kit, but it's better than waiting three months for a $1,500 cylinder and whatever they're gonna charge to put it on. Okay, so you're gonna lose 50 bucks if I'm wrong. So we take our old save a thread and boogie back to the, to the airport. And I walk up to this young AMP and I said, here you go, put that in, fix it right up. Well, I've never seen nothing like that in my life. I said, it's just an overgrown helicoil. You put helicoils in. I said, how long you been a mechanic? What do you say, 12 years? I said, and you've, you work on aluminum aircraft engines and you've never put a helicoil in? Hell, I put one of those in my BB gun. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, he said, I've never done anything like that. And Gil's standing there and he says, fix Larry's plane, Jack. I said, shut up, Gil, I'm on vacation. <laughs> Come on, Jack, you can do it. And I said, shut up, I ain't got no tools. And Larry says, Jack, would you fix my plane? I said, I ain't got no tools. And that kid says, here. And he's got one of them Mack truck toolboxes <laughs> that compensate for his low education. <laughs> so he said, anything you need's right here. And uh, Ian Harvey was there from uh, Australia. Australia, right. I knew I'd think of it. There's, there's only two guys in the whole country of Australia that's certified to work on Stenson, he's one of them. This was the mass fly-in we had in, what was that, 2015, 2012, when was that? 16. Okay, so anyway, okay. So the little kit comes with a special tap that taps the hole out, 
Luckily, I didn't need to drill it out. It was already big enough. So I heard somebody say something about, well, he's going to get aluminum pieces down in the engine. And I asked that kid, I said, you got some grease? Uh, DC4 work? And I said, sure. If you're not familiar with that, it's a silicone type product. And I just, I take the tap and it's got four flutes in it. So I smear some DC4 in those flutes and I start gingerly screwing her down in there. And I screwed her in and I backed it out and I wiped it all off, put some more DC4 on it. The DC4 is catching my chips. They're not going down in the engine. It's a trick I learned when I was about 14 or 15, I don't know. So anyway, I finally got enough threads in there and I put a little bit of Loctite on the save a thread cup and we screw it down in there and I screw the plug down in there. We fire it up and he taxis around a little bit, comes back and Pam's out there by this time. She's standing beside me. Hey, it sounds a lot better. And I said, yeah, I think it's gonna be all right. He said, well, Benji fixed it, I might go flying in it. But uh, it, was, it was a fun experience that this kid had been a mechanic for 12 years and never put a helicoil in. I teach that in my engine class. I make them all put a, a quarter 20 helicoil in because it's almost like putting a bolt in. You're gonna do it. Sometime in your career, you're gonna do it. And the sooner the better. But- uh, Good question. Yeah. Uh, oil temperature. Uh, we were a lot of discussion last night about what the right oil temperature is to maintain and how to maintain it. Can you talk about that? I think, Somewhere in the book, don't it say something about 180 or more? Or maybe that's just something I've read someplace else. I'm, I'm kind of like John. I got so many numbers floating around up here. They all get jumbled up. But I would recommend around 180 and not over 240 because oil starts breaking down at, uh, at 240. And that's one of the reasons we change it. These are air-cooled motors, guys. Engines, I'm sorry. The kid's not supposed to hear me say motor. These are air-cooled engines. So they're a little bit harder on oil. Oh, tore down an 0300 Continental here a while back. It looked like crap inside. This farmer owns it. And my partner sometimes takes in jobs that he shouldn't. But anyway, this is the same one that had all the silicone crap around one of the cylinders. and. What happened was, it looked like a cowling screw had got down in between two cylinders and it had vibrated right into the cylinders. Well, it was okay on one side, but on this side, it was by the exhaust port. And Continental's are real picky about what happens around their exhaust ports, because they need a lot of cooling around there. So anyway, we got a young man from school, he just graduated and he comes over and helps us out. What do you think I ought to do? And I said, pull that cylinder off. You found the screw down there, so you pull the cylinder off. It was a back cylinder on the right side. Great. Pull the cylinder off, and when he did, a couple of the piston rings fell off. This piston was black. The rings were cooked. The inside of the cylinder looked like, if you've ever seen a disc brake rotor with hot spots in it, blue and black hot spots, that's what the cylinder looked like. And he said, my God, what done that? And he, about that time, the owner come in. And I said, he either, because he, he said that oh, this engine's only got 600 hours on a top overhaul. And I said, well, he either broke it in wrong or run the wrong oil or both. About that time, he walked in, he said, there ain't nothing wrong with that mobile oil I run in that airplane. And I said, wait a minute. Mobile don't make an aircraft oil. Well, it's the same oil running my tractors. Works real good. I said, well, the only difference is you've got antifreeze running through that tractor. You don't have any antifreeze here. The oil and the air is the only thing that keeps this engine cool. And if you mess with either one of them, it's gonna cook the engine. Well, they decided to pull the next cylinder off because that screwed eight into that pretty good. Same way, one of the rings fell off. Well, the owner said, I'll take the rest of the cylinders off. You guys are taking too long. Of course we are. God, it's a bargain. It's 
$85 an hour. 100 if you watch. <laughs> 125 if you ask questions while you're watching. 150 if you help. And 200 if you worked on it before I got there. Anyway, he's, he pulled that front cylinder off and all that silicone around, and that was, he ended up taking all the cylinders off because all the pistons were cooked. Well, he's going to get them overhauled. He's going to get six overhaul cylinders from a company in St. Louis. I wrote down the serial numbers, and I told my partner, I'm just helping them. This is not my project. This is my partner's project. I said, here's what he'll do. Keep eye on them cylinders, on the numbers, because he's going to take them down to his tractor buddy. They're going to wire brush them and bring them back and call them overhauled. Sure enough, about three or four days later, he brought them back. You could see he'd done exactly what I said he was going to do. They run a wire brush down in there and knocked the carbon off the valves, washed them up a little bit, and brought them back. He said, here's your overhaul cylinders. And I looked at my partner and I said, it's your name in the logbook, not mine. You want to put them on? Fine. Go ahead. Well, he finally talked him into getting six overhaul cylinders. But anyway, guys, oil is critical to these things. If you don't run a recommended oil in an air-cooled engine, like what was that old commercial on television? Pay me now or pay me later? Well, you can spend 100 bucks on an oil change. About right, ain't it? What's well, a case of oil is about $72, and the oil filter is about $20, $25. I use Tempest oil filters are $20. Bucks. So you can change oil yourself. I recommend that when you change oil, go fly it. Go around the pattern three or four times. Get that engine warmed up real good. Get all the crap that's in there suspended in that oil. When you come back and land, drain it just as hot as you can stand it. Yeah, it's going to burn your fingers, but that engine's going to be a lot more thankful. So if you, especially if you've got a quick drain, you ain't going to burn yourself too bad. Shove a rubber hose up on that quick drain, let it run in the bucket. I usually pull my cowling off. Uh, Franklin's got one of the nicest quick drains in the world, if you've still got the quick drain on it, back on the firewall where it belongs. I just put a, I got a piece of sheet metal that I put in the back of my cowling where any oil that hits that sheet metal will go right in the bucket rather than hitting the cowling and just going everywhere. You just slide that little thing over, drain the oil out while it's nice and hot. Usually that gives me time to pull the top plugs out and do a compression test, check the timing. By that time the engine's cooled down and I can do about anything I want to with it. But uh, you don't have to pull the plugs every time you change oil. I do because it's usually annual time on most of the engines that I work on. Uh, hopefully, like I said, if you don't have a remote oil filter, think seriously about buying one. They're, what, 400 bucks, 500 bucks for an Airwolf oil filter. It'll be the best four or 500 bucks you spend on your airplane. It keeps that crap out of the oil. The metal particles and stuff that we worry about the most because one little metal, metal particle in a bearing, all it has to turn is one time and you've wiped out the bearing. Here's something to think about, something I tell my students. Most Lycomings will run around 22, 2250 for cruise. At 2000 RPM, the piston's going, do the math if you want to, if you don't believe me. I'll bet I could stir some stuff up on the internet with this. At 2,000 RPM, the piston's going up and down 30 times a second. Think about that. Thank you. Hey, Jack, last <laughs> question. What? So, uh, okay, more questions. I don't combine. I just. So, a lot of controversy about running Marvel Mystery Oil in the fuel. And I do, and I've had good success. But can you speak to that? We talked about this at our fly-in the other day, and Larry Wheelock was there. I don't, I don't know what you think of Larry, but Larry's got about 50 years of knowledge to share. And like he said, and I agree with that, I don't always agree with everything he says, 
I don't agree with everything Mike Bush says, but Mike Bush has got some knowledge too. If you don't know who he is, he writes. Anyway, we were sitting there and somebody said something about Marvel Mystery Auto Larry and he said, well, it may not help, but it won't hurt. So if you're running it and you're happy with it, I don't see any reason not to run it. I don't run it personally because I never found any benefit for it. And I think we had a discussion last night about lead and valves, or maybe this morning. There's an old wives' tale that lead lubricated the valves. And they say the same thing about Marvel Mystery Oil, lubricates the valves. It can't possibly lubricate the valves. Maybe the top of the valve, but not the stem where the important part is, because what's a carburetor do? A carburetor vaporizes the gas and mixes it with air around 14, 15 to 1. Okay, when the air fuel mixture goes past the intake valve, it's in a vapor. And you're mixing what? An ounce per 10 gallon, I think is the recommended Marvel Mystery Oil. Okay, four to one, okay. Still, it's in a vapor when it goes by the intake valve. And then after it burns, it's carbon when it comes by the exhaust valve. So tell me how I can lubricate the valves. Okay, so you got it in the, a lot of guys say, put some in the engine oil and put some in the gas. Okay, it's not hurting anything, but I can't see where it's doing any good. Um, um, our gas has already got, especially if you're running low gas, the big problem is additives. That's the reason, when I was a kid, and some of you guys are old enough, remember how gas smelled? You go to, you go to the gas station, get you a gallon of gas or mow the yard with, and it had a certain smell to it. Gas don't smell like that anymore. It smells crappy. And if you leave it in a can or in a fuel tank over about 30 days, it turns to crap. 100 low lead won't. Well, it will if it's in there long enough. It's funny. I can tell a plane that's been setting for a while, you walk up and push the sump, check the sump, and it comes out a real pretty, I mean, dark blue. If it's been setting for a while, the blue all settles down to the bottom of the tank. It comes out of that gas. They put that coloring in there for a reason. So you can tell it from other kinds of gas. Uh, Jet A, <clears throat> if you sump your airplane and the fuel's clear, uh, the guy might have put the wrong stuff in your airplane and smells like kerosene, right? <laughs> But anyway, like, like I said, it don't hurt anything, so. How about oil pressure? What do, you, what do you normally run on oil pressure? Mine is right at the bottom, and it's always been that way. I've run it that way. For well, fix it like we did in his. <laughs> <laughs> but it's never hurt anything, but yeah, I've, I've heard some. Well, if you bump it up, it, might, more and, it might in some cases. Well, what do you call right at the bottom of the range? 30 uh, pounds? Yeah, it's 30. Well, 35 is not too bad. I'd rather see 40 or 45. After we got done overhauling Randy's, and it scared me when we fired the engine up the first time, it was, what, 28, 26, something like that. But we put that oil filter on, so you're gonna lose about five pounds or so with that remote oil filter. And like I said, it kind of scared me. And Randy said, oh, it's always ran low like that. Well, I don't like it running that low. I like 40, 45, because you gotta remember, the crankshaft and the bearings theoretically should never touch. They should have two or three thousandths of oil between those bearings and the crankshaft, same on the camshaft. They should never touch because the oil holds them apart. Well, if your oil pressure gets too low, you're not gonna have that two or three thousandths oil in there, it's gonna be less. 
And then the next thing you know, your crankshaft, it, you may not notice it real quick, but your crankshaft is gonna be wearing on them bearings. Question I ask my students, what's the hardest thing you can do to an engine? Start it up, that's right. It's been setting for overnight, a week, a month, whatever. You first start it up, yep, that bearing's touching that crankshaft. And that's when the most wear occurs, until the oil pressure gets up. So here's what you do. Up on the left front of your engine, there's this crazy looking thing that the oil lines come out of and go to the cooler and come back, yeah. right? There's a big plug in the front yeah. and a smaller plug in the back. We took the wrong plug out first. <laughs> Take the smaller, it's easier if you pull the cowling off, believe me. Oh, you, yeah. can, you can do it. Uh, a big guy like you, maybe not. Get your wife or girlfriend to do it for you. Anyway, take that back plug out. There's a spring in there, so don't lose it. Hopefully, you don't even let it come all the way out. And get you a couple of washers that fit inside that plug. Now, you need a new gasket on it. It's called a crush gasket. It's a copper asbestos crush gasket. So you screw the plug back in. And that gasket touches the surface. It's kind of like putting an oil filter on. When that gasket touches the surface, give it about a quarter turn more. That's all you need, because you're gonna have to do it with a wrench. Uh, and that crush gasket will seal it up. If you try to use the old crush gasket, what happens, Randy? It'll leak again. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and that'll, I think we call Chris, what did he say? One washer equals about five, five pounds. pounds of pressure for every washer. Yeah, so if you wanna boost 10 pounds, put a, two washers in there. Now, just any washer, or I mean, is it a well, or is it a... Well, I happen to use AN washers because that's what I've got yeah, in my hanger. Okay, uh, I, would, I would not go with a, a zinc or a, 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 a plated washer because that plating might eventually come off and get in your oil system. That's the oil bypass valve right there. And it's going so either... what you're doing, you're increasing the resistance on the spring. Yeah. Get, just, yeah. Go get you a couple of old uncoated washers or, that'll fit down in that cap. You don't want them sticking out because you're gonna compress the spring way too much. Right, yeah. That's all you're doing is you're pressing that spring on a little ball in there that's relieving the pressure when it gets up higher. And yeah, that's on the back of the... The back thing. plug, there's two plugs on that yeah. where the oil lines come out and go to the cooler. So yeah. the big plug, the front plug's about that big around. Yeah. And then the back plug is what, seven eighths, something like that. And it's safety wired, so you might want to brush up on, go get you an AC4313 and pick up how to safety wire. It's the small plug though? The small the plug, plug in the back. I'll, I'll open up my engine and show everybody if you want to see it out here later on. Yeah, great. Yeah. So what's the front plug do? Or what? What does the front plug do? It's, it's, uh, uh, it's just more of the oil relief system, but it relieves the oil before it goes to the cooler. So when your oil's cold, it's not shoving that cold oil to the cooler and possibly hurting your cooler. It's shoving it right back in the engine. So when your oil gets warmed up, then that spring, it's kind of like a, people talk about a vernotherm. Yeah. yeah. No, washer underneath that won't happen. It's run 150. You talking about PSI? No, 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 temperature. Oh, temperature. No, 150, 160? Yeah. Mine runs low. I gotta keep a piece of tape on my oil cooler just about year round. Yeah, I got right Yeah, I got a Niagara oil cooler. Well, my engine was overhauled by, um, oh shoot, the company that's no longer in business. A little Red Arrow. A little Red Arrow. And they put, they had their own STC, to, it's just a Niagara oil cooler, and it's a lot more efficient than the old Franklin original coolers. And it's, uh, I think it's got two more rows in it, 13 as opposed to 10 or 11 in the original cooler. So, I, and his has got one too. We keep tape on ours just about year round. I, I need a piece of tape. Anybody got any duct tape? Figures. I wasn't getting much oil temperature on the way down here, but he's got some. 
Like I said, I like to see 180 because actually the temperature is measured after it goes through the cooler and it's going back into the engine. It's probably coming out of the engine 210, 220 maybe, and then going to the oil cooler and getting cooled off, going back in the engine. So your, your oil temperature sensor is right there by that plug and it's measuring it as it goes back into the engine. Uh, at that, I don't really like that. I'd like to know what it is coming out of the engine, but. So Jack, what is the downside of having low oil temperature? Low oil temperature. Your engine, your oil don't get up to proper operating temperature. So that multi-viscosity is thrown out the window for one thing, and your oil is not efficient. Low, uh, it's not cooling off your engine either like it should. Remember that oil flowing through the engine, guys, helps cool it. Here's another trick question I asked my class. How efficient is the piston engine? Between 30 and 35 percent. The rest of it goes out as heat. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What? The low, the low oil temperature, if it's not running above 220 Fahrenheit, or the internet number, it's not getting any of the water out of it. So eventually you'll get water. Okay, that's the other thing, right. That's the other thing. It's not, I hadn't got to that yet. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, the other thing is, any moisture that's in the oil, it's not going to burn off. You know, remember the boiling point of water, it's 212. So if your oil is running low temperature, that water's just going to set in there. God, I drained one one time. The guy said, oh yeah, I got it warmed up. He took it out there and ran it for about five minutes and ran it back in the hangar. And when I moved that little valve, I'll bet you I got a coffee cup full of water out of it. The water goes to the bottom, right? It goes to the bottom of the pan because oil floats on top of water. And I moved that little valve and man, here come all, I go, oh God. Oh, because the whole engine ain't like that. Well, then it started running oil, and I grabbed the oil, and it wasn't tight. It wasn't warm. I don't know if that's the bad thing. You know, the way that hose is set up towards the equipment drain, however, whatever volume of water that holds. Oh, yeah. You should have that. You should have a hose. Sure. What, did I make you guys mad? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've heard about those freezing up. I've never had that happen to me. But uh, yeah, you gotta you gotta get that oil up to temperature, guys, to get the water burned out of it. I had an interesting problem come up on one a few years ago. His engine got to running like crap. It's in the winter time. And his engine got to running like crap. It wouldn't make power. He wouldn't take off. So I got to looking and turned the engine over and it, it felt like it had more compression than it should have had. And then when you get the piston would start back down, all of a sudden it pulled the prop. And I, what the hell's wrong with this thing? And I don't know, I couldn't figure it out for a little bit. And then finally it dawned on me. That tube that comes out of that top where the starter snout is and goes down, had a chunk of ice in the bottom of it. Wow. So the engine was making back pressure. It, they, it couldn't breathe. And uh, I got messed around with that and I run something up in there and I hit that ice and said, ah. Poked the ice out of it and we started the engine up and it ran fine. Some of the things you get into is amazing. <laughs> of course, you guys live down south, don't have to worry about that stuff. We worry about dirt dogs building in them. It don't get cold in Oklahoma, does it? No, it don't get cold with the dirt dogs. <laughs> the dirt wall will build in there. Yeah. 
And what? High oil pressure. Yeah, it comes up just shy of 60. If, if it's always had high oil pressure, then how high is high? 50, 60 pounds? If it's always had a high oil pressure and it hadn't quit now, I wouldn't worry about it too much. But if you all of a sudden get a high oil pressure, then you need to worry. Something's going on in there. That's usually oil pressure going up considerably is a sign of a spun bearing. That's been that way since day one. It's always been high. Go to the National Aeromotive Parts Hanger. No, Napa, N A P A. Na and anyway, get you a $10 gauge off a car. Screw that in there and compare them. That's the first thing I'd do. Uh, I've ran into that problem before, and I keep one uh, in my toolbox just for checking stuff. It's not calibrated. It's not maybe not that accurate, but it'll give you a, a, a comparison, a baseline. I had a 172 come in one time. A young man was ferrying it from Ohio to someplace I don't remember. Anyway, it just had overhaul. Just come out of the shop, overhaul. He said, my oil pressure went down. Really? Well, let's check it. So in the back of a Lycoming or Continental, there's a little fitting that's got an orifice in it, a real small hole that your oil line goes to, your oil pressure to. And anyway, the reason they've got that is if you would break the line between there and the gauge, hopefully you wouldn't lose all your oil before you could get it on the ground. It's got a real small hole. So anyway, my automotive gauge won't fit, and I have to screw that out to screw my automotive gauge in there. And I screwed that out. Hey, looky here. There's some black sealer on there. Rubbed it all off, and I rubbed it in my hand. And it was regular aircraft sealer. And he's on the phone to his boss that overhauled this engine. Let me talk to him. And I said, you use sealer? Well, once in a while, we have to use sealer. I said, did you ever learn that part in AMP school about keep the sealer a minimum three threads from the end of stuff? Same way on spark plugs. You put spark plugs back in the hole, guys. Put your anises, keep it back away from the end because most anises is metallic and it'll short out your spark plug. But anyway, this had sealer over the end of that little orifice. And I hooked my automotive gauge up and we started up the engine and had 50 pounds of oil pressure. I said, you're good to go. You got oil pressure. And we screwed it back in there and put hooked these. He said, how are you gonna mount that gauge so I can read it? And I said, you ain't getting this gauge. <laughs> so, I. I hooked his regular gauge back up, and his Cessna gauge was showing about 30 pounds. And he said, well, your gauge said 50. And I said, you know you've got oil pressure. Go on to where you're going, you're fine. We got the sealer wiped off the end of it. So, like I said, it's just for comparison purposes. Usually, most any mechanical gauge like that, uh, I'll, I'll keep one around of some kind. Gas gauges are famous for lying to you. Um, tachometers. I don't keep a spare tack around, but a lot of times a tack is not accurate. I do have a electronic gizmo I can point at the prop, and it's really accurate. I've checked it numerous times. In fact, I've got one that uh, it's a new style. You can even set it up on the panel, and if it can see the prop through there, it'll tell you the RPM it's turning. Just Little tips and tricks like that is what makes us gods. <laughs> Wasn't this awesome? Jack, thank you, man. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs>